life in the real world isn't always fair, it isn't always fun. Sometimes you get a big gap between what you expect and what you experience. Then what? Where can you turn to get help to deal with the messiness and complexity of life in the real world? Two words, the Psalms. Right in the center of the Bible, there's a collection of songs and prayers and poems called the Psalms. The Psalms have been called the prayer book, the worship book, the song book of the Bible. The Psalms were Jesus' favorite book. He memorized the Psalms, he quoted the Psalms, he even prayed the Psalms aloud. No follower of Christ can ignore this prayer book of Jesus called the Psalms. There are times in life when you just don't know what to say, times of tremendous sorrow, or even times of overwhelming joy. Where are the words to express how we really feel? Well, the Psalms can speak to you, providing words to capture the emotions of how you really feel. There are also times when Psalms can speak for you, times when we don't know what to pray, don't know how to pray, don't know how to express what's happening in our lives to God. And the Psalms can speak both to you and for you. The voices of the Psalms help us to find our own voice with God. No matter what your season, what your circumstance, what your situation is, God is enough. In our prayers, we spend a season in the Psalms together that you would allow these Psalms to speak to you and you allow these Psalms to speak for you. And in doing so, you would find that God is enough. One of the things we've been learning in the Psalms, if you've been doing the reading plan at all, is the congruence between the body and the heart, that the body does what's happening in the heart. So as we begin this morning, let's all put our hands out in front of us. Uh, put your hands out in front of you like you've got something, and let's pray together. God, as we gather today, as we open your word, as we seek you, each and every one of us with hands in front of us, God, we, we need something. And so our prayer today is, God, give us what we need today. Our prayer is that you would give encouragement where encouragement is needed, strength, hope, uh, direction, guidance, redirection, whatever the need today. We believe, God, in these next moments together as we open your word, as we sit in your presence, that you will meet that need. We pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Well, let me welcome you to week four, concluding our series together, Enough is Enough. If you pay attention when you watch TV, it's not too hard to pick up that every commercial seems to be based on the same thing. More, get more, want more, you deserve more, rewards, benefits, and it's like more, more, more. We're perpetually being trained to be dissatisfied all the time. And so we go through life always dissatisfied, always chasing more, yet we never find ourselves at the place where enough is enough. Well, as A.W. Tozer said, whoever has God for their treasure has all things in one. And the study in the Psalms that we're doing, uh, we're coming to the place where enough is enough because God is enough. Our study has two components. One is we do a psalm per weekend together like we're about to do, and also a psalm per weekday. If you have the reading plan, you're tracking along. I hope you are. Uh, each week we have a, a set of psalms for the weekdays that are built off of the weekend before. If you have not gotten the reading plan, get one in the info center, or you can get one from an usher, or you can go to our Facebook page, like us, and check it out. There's a reading plan there. But I definitely hope that you're going along in the psalms with us this way because, honestly, reality is many people, like, how do I grow closer to God? How do I pray? Psalms. Psalms. Psalms are prayers. Pray those prayers, you'll learn how to pray. So psalms are vital, have always been vital for the church. So if you're not in the psalms, I'm telling you, you're missing out. So take use of the plan and our time together and let God use these psalms. So today I want to talk with you about how God is enough. God is enough. If you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 23. We're going to be in the 23rd Psalm today. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have everything on the screen so we can all follow along. Don't want to lose anybody. Also, if you have a smartphone, you can turn it on to a Colonial Church live event. You'll, you'll find us there, and you can follow along in the notes. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way in the seat back in front of you, grab a piece of paper, take some notes, because there will be some really interesting things that you can write down today for your own spiritual journey. Uh, my personal view is if you really want to grow, write some stuff down. Don't write it down. Good luck. And so write it down. Uh, by show of hands, if we get started today, how many of you know, by show of hands, how many of you know what time it is. 
No, I'm sorry, not the time of day, not the time of day, the time in your life. If your life expectancy were measured like with a clock, do you know what time it is in your life? Uh, how many of you, um, by show of hands today, you're in your 20s? You're in your 20s? Let me see your hand. You're in your 20s? If you are 22 years old, it's 8.20 a.m. in your life right now. So you got like the whole day ahead of you. You're like, what am I going to do today? Well, I'm not going to shower. I'm going to have bed head, probably play video games. I probably live with my parents if you're in your 20s. How many of you are in your 30s? Can you see your hands? Show of hands, 30s. If you are 32 years old, it's 11.20 a.m. in your life, which means you're starting to think like about lunch right now, right? It's like, I'm hungry. Where do you want to eat? Let's go eat. It's time to eat. How many of you are in your 40s? By show of hands, 40s. If you are 42 years old, it is 3.20 p.m. in your life right now. That means you're starting to think about, when can we get off work? I want to be done working. Can we knock off and not be working anymore? How many of you, by show of hands, are in your 50s? Can I see your hands? 50s, 50s? If you are 52 years old, it's 6.20 p.m. in your life right now. You're not thinking about dinner. You know what you're thinking about? Where did the day go? And wow, nighttime's almost here. By show of hands, how many of you are in your 60s? 60s, 60s? If you are 62 years old, it's 9.20 p.m. You're like, what? <laughs> 9.20 p.m. You know what you're thinking about? You're thinking about... Well, bedtime. Now, help me out, everybody. True or false, um, as life goes by, the older you get, the faster life goes by. True or false? It's true. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, second grade took forever. But 2013, I'm still not even used to writing it. It's almost over. You believe Thanksgiving is this week? Life is flying by. One anonymous author summed it all up this way. Here's what he said, quote, When I was a child, I wanted to be an adult with freedom and respect. When I was 20, I wanted to be 30, more mature and sophisticated. When I was middle-aged, I wanted to be 20, full of youth and energy. When I was retired, I wanted to be middle-aged, seasoned by experience without physical limitations. But then my life was over, and I realized... I never got what I wanted. You're taking notes today. Here's our big idea. When God is all you want, then God is all you'll need. When God is all you want, then God is all you will need. Now, let's just be honest. Many of us, our lives are, are, are characterized by dissatisfaction. Here's what it looks like. Whatever you have, you want something else. No matter what, whatever you have, you want something else. And so you go after that something else. And when you get that something else, it doesn't take long. Sooner or later, you're bored with that something else. It doesn't do it anymore, and you need something more. And when you need something more, what do you do? You go after something else. Our lives are characterized by dissatisfaction. Now, let's also be honest. Let's go further. Let's be honest. You can spend or waste a whole life doing that over and over and over always leaving something for something else, needing something more, going for something else. Children who, who, who want more toys become teenagers who want more freedom, become adults who want more money, who become seniors who want more time. Let's be honest. Life is short. Time is running out. And so whatever matters most we need to get after it right now while there's still some time. We've done a lot of funerals here lately. Life is short. Whatever matters, you better get after it and get after it today. Here's the bad news. Whatever you go after, whatever you get, you'll always need something more. Newsflash. As human beings, we were made for more. We were made for more. The God who created, created us with a desire for more. But here's the problem. We were not made for more things. More things do not lead to satisfaction, or else we wouldn't do the game. But we do the game. Christmas is an example every year. We do the game. We were made for more than things. We were made for more. We were made for more than experiences. Though we chase experiences, and we always need more experience. We were made for more than things, more than experiences, more than other people. We were made for some satisfaction that we just can't seem to get. So how in the world are we ever going to find this satisfaction? 
We were made for more. How do we get to that more? Well, for that, we will turn to our friend, C.S. Lewis, who died 50 years ago, two days ago. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, says it as only he can. Here it is, quote, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for these desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If I find in myself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. How in this world can we find the satisfaction that somehow isn't in this world? Well, welcome to Psalm 23. This is exactly what Psalm 23 is all about. And so a little backstory before we dive in. Psalm 23 is one of the most famous and also most favorite psalms in the world. This psalm is beloved by Jewish people and Christian people. They love Psalm 23. In the Christian realm, it's one of those texts of Scripture that all brands of Christians love. From you know, Eastern Orthodox to Western Protestant to Roman Catholic, everybody loves Psalm 23. Psalm 23. It's memorized by children, recited at weddings, an encouragement to the bedridden, comfort at funerals. Psalm 23. The superscription above the psalm simply reads, a psalm of David. Technically, it's called a psalm of trust or a psalm of confidence written by King David. Here's what you need to know. Most of us think Psalm 23. We think Psalm 23, David, young guy, he's a shepherd boy staring up at the sky. The Lord is my shepherd. Nope, not at all. David is an older man with scars and wounds and pain and a long journey. And he's writing Psalm 23, looking back over a lifetime of a journey of the God who always has been enough, always will be enough, because he is enough. And so David writes this Psalm to us so that we too might know the same journey and know this same God who is enough. That is Psalm 23. So the question then becomes, how can God become enough to us? How does that happen? And so I want you to write some things down. God becomes enough, number one. God becomes enough when God is my God. God becomes enough first when God is my God. Now, by show of hands, how many of you were an infant at some point in your life? That's everybody? Is that all? Yeah, all of us are infants? Now, let me ask you, as an infant... As an infant, how many of you fed yourself? As an infant, not, not a whole lot. Uh, as an infant, how many of you uh, changed your own diapers? Uh, not many. That'd be a trick, wouldn't it? Uh, how many of you, as an infant, um, as an infant, you provided your own housing? Not, not many. So here's some facts of life. Fact of life number one. As an infant, you cannot make it on your own. True or false? It's true. Fact of life number two, as a person, you cannot make it on your own. You cannot. David begins where we must all begin, with the bedrock basic fact, I can't make it on my own. We're in Psalm 23. Let's begin where David begins. Verse one, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want you to notice the term Lord right there. Here's, here's the name Lord. I want you to notice something special. You notice it's in all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps. Two versions of the word Lord in English Bibles. One would be capital L and then lowercase O-R-D, and the other one would be capital L, capital O, capital R. They're two different Hebrew words. This one, the capital, all caps, is Yahweh. It's, if those of you who love theology, here's a toy you can play with the rest of the day. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Go look it up and have fun tracking down all of it. Simply means that uh, God's name, Yahweh, is four consonants, Y-H-W-H. It's the divine name of God. This is the name that God used of himself when he spoke to Moses in, in Exodus 3. Now, here's the scene. In Exodus 3, God's people have been in slavery for 400 years, and God hears their cry. He sees their oppression like he hears your cry and sees your oppression. He hears it. He sees it. He's moved to act. So he calls Moses. He's like, hey, 
You're going to go, you're going to lead them. I'm going to deliver my people. I want you to do this. And Moses said, how do I tell these people that God is going to deliver them? He's like, here's what you tell them. You tell them I sent you. And the name that he uses for I sent you is this name. This is the covenant name of God. It means two things. Number one, this is a relationship word. It's a special relationship between God and his people. Like you have a special relationship with you and your kids, different than the kid down the block, that thing. It's this relationship word. God's like, I will be your God, you'll be my people. It's a relationship word. Secondly, it's a commitment word. God binds his loyalty, his leadership, his love to his people in a special way. In the same way that a husband and wife, in their oath to one another, in their vows in a wedding, bind their love in a way that's different between them and any other people that they know. It's a relationship word, it's a commitment word. But I also want you to notice something else. David says that the Lord is my shepherd. Fourth word, the Lord is my, my. What's David doing? Where's he begin? Here's where he begins. He's beginning with the truth that I can't make it on my own. And here's what David's saying. David is saying, I need God. David, he's even saying more than that. He's not saying, I need God. He's saying, I need God to be my God. I need God to be God of me, over me, to me. Be my God. And so David is just starting with the basic truth, I can't make it on my own. But the reality is there are many of us who do try to make it on our own without God. Many of us. We surveyed 100 people, top three answers are on the board to this question. Why don't people want God to run their lives? Uh, Answer number three, ding, 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 religion. Like, oh, religion, God and religion. And God's religious. He likes rules and religious. So no thank you very much. Not realizing that God does not extend religion to us. That's what we create, not God. He's a relationship all the way, as the term Lord describes. It's a relationship word. We surveyed 100 people. Top three answers are on the board to the question, why don't people want God to run their lives? Religious and number two, ding, 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 irrelevant. So many people feel like God's irrelevant. They pick up a Bible, they read names and places that are foreign, they're like, this makes no sense to me. God must be irrelevant. No, it's called history. And it's a long history, and it's God doing real things with real people in real time, not in your city. And so it should be different for you. Like reading somebody else's mail, you won't understand. See how that works? But God's like irrelevant now. I don't understand this, so God doesn't understand me. How arrogant, but that happens, so... We surveyed 100 people, top three answers are on the board of the question, why don't people want God to run their lives? Too religious, irrelevant. Number three, ding, 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 here's the number one answer. The number one, too restrictive. A lot of people feel like God's just like a big buzzkill, man. He just wants to take stuff away. His favorite word, don't. Stop. He's like a mean parent. It will never let the kids have fun. And so, so many people have that sort of a view of God. Yet David uses a picture, shepherd. It's not a religious picture. That's not some kind of an irrelevant picture. It's a relationship picture. If we can look at the relationship part of it, it makes perfect sense to us. In fact, all throughout the scripture, God is referred to as a shepherd. Here's a great verse. If you like to memorize verses, here's a great one. Isaiah 40, verse 11, says that God himself, will, he will lead his people, he will shepherd them, and he will lead them gently. He will lead us. That's awesome. All throughout scriptures, God is pictured as a shepherd. Second thing, all throughout scriptures, people are, are spoken of as sheep. 65 times people are referred to as sheep. Here's an example. Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each has gone to his own way. Does that sound about like us? Sure enough. God is a shepherd. People are sheep. But then here's the third thing. Jesus Christ, it says in Matthew 9, 36, was moved with compassion when he looked out on the crowds and he saw everyday people harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw people all going their own way, nipping at each other, lonely, broken, and hurting, and it moved his heart. Fourth thing, Jesus then spoke up, and he said of himself, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. Put it all together. God is a shepherd, and we're sheep, and we go running around, and Jesus sees that, and he's like, no way, I gotta bring him home. And so he comes to gather us to be his people and to bring us home, to take us home. This is the imagery. So then the question then becomes, what does that look like? I mean, in our lives today, for God to be a shepherd, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how many of us have sheep, but what does it look like? Well, two things jumped out. Two things jumped out. It looks like for God to be shepherd, number one, you can write this down, he provides what I need. He provides what I need. Verse two, David goes on, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. 
beside still waters. What's he saying? He's saying God provides what I need. Now, help me out, everybody. True or false? There's a big difference between wants and needs. True or false? Big difference. How many of you have kids? Do kids know the difference between wants and needs? No, they do not. Like, you know, kids are like, I need a new game. You don't need a new game. You need to do your homework or clean your room. But adults know the difference, shouldn't they? You know, guys like, I need new golf clubs. You don't need new golf clubs. You need to go mow the yard. <laughs> Wants, needs. What's David saying? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, he makes me lie down at green pastures. That's food. Sheep eat green pastures. They don't drive up in a window and then get food. Green pastures, food. Second thing, still waters, drink. The basic stuff of life. God provides the basic stuff of life. He provides what I need. Not always what I want, but always what I need. Second thing, David says that he doesn't just provide what I need. He guides where I go. Notice in verse 3, he guides where I go. David continues on. He restores my soul. This is verse 3. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I want you to notice this word paths. In Hebrew, it's magal. Magal is a very interesting word. It's related to the word cow and cart. When a cow pulls a cart, they pull it, and it creates a well-worn track that that cow follows every time that takes them home. The path that takes you home. He leads me. He guides my life on the right ways that lead me. Not every road leads home. He guides us down the paths that lead to home. So the question is, how do I know if God's my shepherd? How can I know? Well, here's a question. Um, do you have all you want? Mm, do you have all you need? In the text, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. The word want is chaser. Chaser means to lack, to deprive, to need. It's followed by, or it's preceded by a negative. Not to lack, not to need, not to be deprived of. When God is my shepherd, I got everything I need. How do I know if God's my shepherd? Do you, do you need stuff? Because there are many of us, we still need things. We still, we're still chasing. I love the fact that this word want in Hebrew, when you look at it transliterated in English, it's C-H-A-S-E-R. Chaser. We look at it and see chaser, which is exactly what it is. When God is my shepherd, I'm not chasing stuff. Why? I have what I need. I'm good. I got what I need. I'm not a chaser. When God is my shepherd. Fact of life number one, in, as an infant, you did not, you did not make it on your own. Fact of life number two, as a person, you cannot make it on your own. You need God. Not God in general. You need God to be your God. I need God to be my God. That's where David begins. God becomes enough, number one, when God is my guide. Number two, God becomes enough when God is my guide. Write that down, number two, when God is my guide. Guide. Now, by show of hands, I'm curious to know, how many of you do not like change? How many of you do not like change? At 930, every one of them. I'm like, yeah, I know you guys. I know. We don't like change. The only change I want, change in my pocket. Don't like change. We, we avoid change. We despise change. But we can't prevent change. Change. We have a hard time with change. You know, there are three things you can't change, right? Three things you can't change. Number one, you can't change the weather. Number two, you can't change another person. Might as well try to change the weather. It's easier than trying to change another person. Number three, you cannot change God, his will, or his ways. You can't change them. You can't change them. So the question that becomes, why do we hate change so much? Here's the answer. We fear not being in control. We fear not being in control. Uh, newsflash. You're not in control. Any sense of being in control is an illusion of control. We're not in control. Many years ago, uh, many years ago, my kids are little. Stores came out with one of the great inventions of our lifetimes. It's the shopping cart shaped like a car. You remember those? I remember when they first came out. The kids jumped inside, and we're going through stores. They're making all the sounds. <laughs> It's got the steering wheel, right? So every time we go around the corner, the boys are like, Aah! it's like the Dukes of Hazard, you know, they're all hooting and hollering. I'm yelling with them because I'm a boy. 
So we're going through the store. They're turning the wheel. We're making motor sounds. We're screeching around the corners. They really thought that they were in control. Were they in control? No, no. Who is in control? I was in control. They were under the illusion of control. I was actually in control. And I think we do the same thing with God. We go along in our journey with God. We're like, we're going here. And God's like, no, we're not. We're going to go this way. God's like, no, we're going where we're going. For all the noise that we make, for all the steering wheel actions that we do, the real reality is that God is the one who's in control. It's his hand that's moving things along, and it's his path that he will guide us down, whether or not we go left or right. He is the one who will guide. Everyone point to the one who's actually in control. Not me. Not me. So the question is, where's God guiding us? Where's he guiding us? If he's guiding, where's he guiding us? The answer, down paths of righteousness. Now that's different than paths of easiness. That's different from paths of convenience. That's different from paths of preference. Some of you are Christians, been a long time. As soon as you figure out the difference between righteousness and preference, your life will get easier. God doesn't care what you prefer. He does not. He never will. He's got his own plan, and it's better. He leads us down his paths of righteousness. And what does that look like? Well, David helps us. Psalm 23, verse 4. Here we go. We're jumping in. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want to draw your attention to that second word, though, even though. In Hebrew, it's key. Key means when, since, or because. And when it's preceded by even, even though, it becomes emphatic. So what David is saying is, hey, uh, what I'm about to say It's not a matter of if. This is when. This is when. When what? When things change. True or false? Help me out. Sometimes things totally change. True or false? It's true. Sometimes you make a plan. You make a plan, the weather changes on you. Sometimes you make a plan, the world changes on you. The world, like you get a degree in a field, that's gone. Things change. Things can change. God will lead us to this place where he's enough. How does he do it? He takes us to a season, a time, a path that will have change. Two things I noticed, two changes that God will guide you to and God will guide you through. They're not in your notes, but I would write these down. Two changes, they're coming your way, probably happening now for many of us. Two changes. Number one, our circumstances will change. Our circumstances will change. Verse 4 Begins. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, okay, track with me. What just changed? Something changed. Verse 2, green pastures, quiet waters. Verse 4, valley of the shadow of death. Something just changed. What did, did you notice? The world just changed. The world just changed. What happened? How in the world did they get from green pastures and still waters to the valley of the shadow of death? Oh, God did it. You would what? <laughs> this term, shadow of death, three words in English, one word in Hebrew, salmaveth. It's used 20 times in the Old Testament. Here's what it means. Always, 20 times. Deep, dark, death. God will lead you and me down a path into a valley of deep, dark, Something's going to die there. He will do this. This is what he does. Why? Here's why. You can learn more about life from death than you do about life. You can learn more about God from death than you do from life. We learn more about a lot from death than we do from life. Why would he take me into this valley? Here's why. Another good friend, G.K. Chesterton, says the following, quote, One sees great things from the valley. One sees only small things from the peak. You ever been up on a mountain? You look down at the people, are they big or small? They're small. But when you're down in the valley, you look up at the sky and the mountains and everything is big. God will take you to a valley, a deep, dark, death valley, because you'll see things there. You can, he has so much to show you. God has so much to show you. 
that you can only see from that valley. There's so, there's so much to show you. So much about himself and his greatness. So much about yourself and your weakness. So much about so many things. That's one thing. Here's a second thing that I really want to emphasize to you. This sh shadow of death. Salmaveth. Deep, dark death. Why would God lead us there? Why would this path, his path run through that place? Here's why. God is trying to make deep people. God is trying to make deep people, not shallow people, deep people. Deep people are made in deep places who go through deep things with God, deep, dark, death things, and they walk with him through there, and they find that he is enough there. Those are deep people. Those are the psalmists. That's what we're reading there. Those are the people like Lewis and Chester. That's why there aren't any like him anymore. We don't have deep people. Nobody wants to go there. We want to go in the land of maximize your life and all this other stuff. That's where God will lead. God is trying to, Jesus is a deep person. He walked that valley. You know, Psalm 22 comes before Psalm 23, don't you? Psalm 22, verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' words from the cross. God will lead you through a deep, dark, death valley. He will do this. He's trying to make deep people. So our circumstances will change. Here's the second thing. Second thing that will change, number two, our closeness to God will change. This blew my mind. Our closeness to God will change. Okay, track this. Verse four, David goes on. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. Okay, track with me. Here we go. Verses two and three, five times David refers to God. He, 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 him, or his. Five. Okay, verse two, he makes me lie down, he leads me. Verse three, he restores my soul, he leads me. His name, five times, he, 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 his. Notice the change in verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod, your set. Something changed, something changed. David went from talking about God, he, 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 to talking to God. You, you, you. God will lead you through a deep, dark, death valley thing so you'll quit talking about him and start talking to him. So you go from a horizontal thing to a vertical thing. Did you see it? He, 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 his, you. Your. That's one change. That's one change. David went from speaking about God to speaking to God. That's a lot closer. Here's a second change. Second change, second change. Verse 2. He says that he leads me beside still waters, verse three. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Go to verse four. I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Second change. The first one, he goes from speaking about God to to God. The second one, God goes from being before him to being beside him. He leads me, he leads me, he's with me. God went from being out front to being alongside, to going before. It's one thing to lead like this. It's another thing to lead like this. Change. change. How does this change occur? How does this change occur? The valley of the shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death deepens your closeness with God, if you will go there. Sadly, I'm just going to be honest with you, many Christians today will not go there. I have a lot to say about that, and I won't. We won't go there. Henry Nouwen, I'd like to introduce you to another friend. Henry Nouwen, Catholic priest, died in the late 90s. Uh, one of the greatest writers of all time. One of my goals in life, to read everything Lewis has written, which will take a life, and another one is to read everything Henry Nouwen has written. Uh, Henry Nouwen has written a book, many, many books, one called In the Name of Jesus. If you are a Christian, you have to read, and then it's a little book, 110 pages, a cup of coffee, you're done. It is super powerful, amazing book. Henry, with an I, Nouwen in the name of Jesus. By the way, a little footnote, if you look up Henry now and you see a bunch of Christians trash talking like he's a universalist, no. If you go, what's a universalist? Don't worry about it. If there's a lot of trash talk about now and it really ticks me off because I've read his work. None of it's justified. But when they go on, here's now and here's what he says in the name of Jesus. Quote, the world says when you were young, you were dependent and could not go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll be able to make your own decisions, go your own way, control your own destiny. But Jesus has a different view of maturity. 
Jesus' vision of maturity. It's the ability and the willingness to be led where you would rather not go to unknown, undesirable, and painful places. When will God be enough? When God gets to lead. Not a moment before. God becomes enough when, number one, God is my God. Number two, God is my guide. Number three, God becomes enough when God is my good. When God is my good. Good news. Life is full of good things. We have good friends, good family, good relationships. You can have good jobs. You can have you know, good uh, finances. You can have all kinds of good things, good health. A show of hands, how many of you know somebody? Show of hands, how many of you ha- know somebody who's lost money? By show of hands, how many of you know somebody who's lost a friend? By show of hands, how many of you know somebody lost a loved one? How many of you know somebody who's lost a home? How many of you know somebody's lost their health? All the good things that we can have can be taken from us. We can lose them all. Good news, life's full of good things. Bad news, they can all be taken away. All of them. Got one. Augustine, the doctor of the church, fifth century, he wrote, quote, the highest good than which there is no higher is God. And consequently, he is unchangeable good. All other good things are only good from him. Here, here's the point. When, when God is your good, When God is your good, no one will ever be able to take your good away. When God is your good, you will never lose your good. When God is your good, no one can take your good away from you. At this point in Psalm 23, David changes the imagery. Unfortunately, most teachers and commentators, the commentators do it, I think, rightly. A lot of preachers don't. We continue with the shepherd thing to the end. Nope. David changes the imagery, and we should follow his change of imagery because it's more meaningful, and it's truer to the point. David changes the imagery, and he's trying to help us see how God is not just good, but his good. He's showing us what it looks like. So then the question is, does this describe me? Does this describe you when God is my good? So David pictures himself in two different ways, and I want you to write these down. David pictures himself, number one, at the table with God. He pictures himself at the table with God. Let's look at verse 5. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I want you to notice the word prepare here. Uh, It's arak in Hebrew, to furnish, to arrange. God is now a person who has furnished and arranged a table for David to sit at. Now, help me out. By show of hands, how many of you would agree? If you really want to get to know somebody, sit at a table, share a meal. You'll really get to know them better. You agree with that? Absolutely. And David's describing his relationship with God in terms of sitting at a table. And so for me, three questions came to mind. Boom, boom, boom. I wrote them down. I'd write them down if I were you. Here they are. Three questions. Question number one, whose table do I sit at? Whose table do I sit at? You, we all choose our table. Whose table are you sitting at? Where do you belly at? Where do you hang out? Whose table? We all pick our table. And I'll tell you what, one of my uh, life verses, Psalm 107, verse 9. He satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with good things. Psalm 107, verse 9. Where am I sitting? That's my table. You can go to any table you want. That's where I'm going. So that's the question. What table do I sit at? Here's the second question. Whose presence matters? Whose presence matters? David mentions right here, being seated in the presence of my enemies. It seems so nonchalant. He prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. It's like, it's like the presence of his enemies mean nothing. Why? Because the presence of God means everything. The greatest good you have is the presence of God in your life. If you have that, you've got everything. If you do not have that, you have nothing. Whose presence matters. Here's a third question. Who fills my cup? Who fills my cup? I want you to notice, David says, um, you know, it's my head with oil and my cup overflows. This word overflows, we looked at it in week one. Revaga, satisfied. David's like, I'm at the table with God. He fills my cup. And you know what? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Why is David good? Because God fills his cup. 
But there are many of us, we're looking around for other people to fill our cup. We're looking for a spouse to fill our cup. And that's a cup only God can fill. We're looking for another human being, a boy or a girl, to come and fill our cup. And that's a cup that only God can fill. We're expecting human beings to fill a cup that only God can fill. Who fills my cup? Who fills my cup? David pictures himself, first of all, at the table with God. Secondly, secondly, David pictures himself, and here's another image. We have to follow his images. David pictures himself at home with God. At home with God. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's great desire to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This word dwell, yashav, yashav means to inhabit, to occupy. David pictures relating with God like a home. Think about a home. Think about home. Wait, no. Think about homeless. What makes you homeless? Oh, I've got no place to sleep. That makes me homeless. Mm -mm. Homelessness is not about having a place to sleep. Homelessness is about not having a place where you fit. It's not having a place where you belong. So many of us are going through life and we're trying to find the place where we fit, where we belong, and it just ain't happening. Listen, there's one place called home. His name is God. God is home. Come home. He's where you belong. He's where you fit. He's the one. See, you know, but I've heard a lot of promises from a lot of people in my life, and they've let me down. How many of you say that's been me? I've heard a lot of promises, let me down, hurt me. I'll be honest, it's me. How I know all this stuff that God can do, would do, will do. How do I know? Here's how. Verse 6. Surely, that's a good thing. Surely. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. The word mercy in Hebrew, chesed. It's the word we've been looking at for a month. Chesed. The unconditional, unmerited, loyal love of God to those who belong to him. Chesed. Let's contrast chesed love with human love just for a moment. Human love is conditional. I love you if, I love you when, I love you so long as, and when those conditions aren't met, love goes away. Not so, chesed love. Chesed is different. Here's the definition. You can write this down. Here's chesed. Here it is. It's God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love to those who belong to him. That's a mouthful. Let's look at that again. Chesed, God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love to those who belong to him. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Psalm 23 is all about chesed, the God of chesed who binds himself to you in relationship. Here's how I know. What's the second word of Psalm 22, or it's 23? The Lord, go to the last verse, verse six. What's the second to last word of Psalm 23? I'll dwell in the house of the, is that in all caps? Yes, it is. Psalm 23 starts with the God of chesed and it ends with the God of chesed. It is all about the God of chesed. He will never let you Go. Track the journey. Track the journey of Psalm 23. Here it is. Because the God of Chesed is my shepherd, I've got everything I need. He guides me into right paths. His presence fills my life. And no matter what, he will never, ever let me go, and he will bring me safely home forever. That's a promise. That's Psalm 23. Chesed. Let me boil it down even further. To those who belong to him, and we don't all belong to him. We have to choose to. For those who belong to him, God says to you, I will never let you go. I will never let you go. You can run all you want. I will never let you go. A century ago, two ministers went on holiday together. And they went up to the Welsh hills to explore the moors. While they were up there, they found a young little shepherd boy getting to know and interacting, and they found he'd never been to school, didn't know how to read, and didn't have a Bible. 
And wanting to help him find faith in Christ, they taught him the 23rd Psalm. Like, he's a shepherd boy. He should, this should make sense. So he taught him the, the 23rd Psalm. And you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. And he loves you. And this is what it's like to know him. This is what it's like to belong to him. So they taught him this psalm. The following year, they went back, back to the hills. And when they got there, they had called at a cottage and knocked on a door, and a, a woman brought them in, and they were waiting for her to get him a drink. And they noticed on the uh, mantle a picture of that boy. And they were staring at it, going, hey, we know that boy. And the woman said, oh, that's my son. He died a year ago in a winter storm while he was tending his sheep. Curious thing, though, when we found him, his right hand was clutching the fourth finger on his left hand. He wouldn't let it go. I mean, he wouldn't let it go. And the one minister looks at the other one, and he looks back at the woman, and he says, you know, we were here a year ago, and we met your boy, and we taught him the 23rd Psalm, told him how it's about Jesus, the good shepherd, we wanted him to know that every time you go over that 23rd Psalm, you need to know that this Psalm is for you because this God is for you. This Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is for you. Here's the best way to remember. When you get to that fourth word, just stop and say, this is for me. The Lord is my, my. Your parting words, whatever you do, do not let go of the God who will never let go of you. Pray. God, as we uh, sit in your presence, I mean, where are the words? I mean, what do you say? I guess we say thank you. Thank you that you love us, that you pursue us, that you care about us that you commit your love to those who belong to you. What can we say? And God, as we realize today that life is so short, we really do need to get after what matters most. Our prayer, God, that you would guide us into your path in this moment as we respond to your truth. There's some of you here today with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you belong to God. You love him and you're trying to serve God the best you can. But the reality is maybe you find that today that you've, you're one of those ones always chasing something else. Maybe that's happening to you. Maybe you're realizing there's a shepherd problem, that God has not become all that you want. You've wanted other things. And maybe your prayer today is, oh, God, help me. God, forgive me. God, fill me. Others of you here today as a Christian, maybe you're in that valley, that deep, dark valley where something is dying and you're hurting. Maybe your prayer today is, God, help me to see. What do you want to show me? What are you trying to show me about me my choices, my life, about you. God, show me. Some of you here today, that quite honestly, as a Christian, you become aware that there are some places you'd rather not go. And you have selectively obeyed God. Maybe right now you're sensing, you know, God, I'm sorry. I've tried to get you to do my thing instead of following your path. There's some of you here today as a Christian, maybe your prayer is, God, you are everything to me. I rejoice in the fact that your presence is in my life life. If you're here today as a Christian, your prayer is, God, I do not want to let go. I never want to let go. I never want to let go of the one who will not let go of me. If that's your prayer today, I don't want to let go. Go ahead and raise your hand. Slip it up. I want to pray for you. God, thank you. Thank you that you will never let us go. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you that you are good. All the days of our life, your said follows us, taking us all the way home with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we continue praying today, there's some of you that the truth is you do not belong to God. It's something you have to choose. And you can't point to a moment when you say, yeah, that's when I chose God as my shepherd. And the truth is all of the amazing things in this psalm do not belong to you because you do not belong to God. But you can belong to God. This is why he brought you here today, to step into a covenant relationship with God, to reach out your hand and grab onto him and say, I choose to belong to you. But there is an issue. The issue is called sin. We have gone our own way. You've done your own thing. You've come up empty. 
and it just isn't working. You have to turn from your sin into the good shepherd, Jesus. He looks out on you and he sees you. He sees your pain, your emptiness, and your loneliness. And he wants you to know that he came for you. He died on a cross for you. His forgiveness is for you and his presence is for you. If you're here today and your prayer is, Christ, I want you, I need you, be my God, be my shepherd. If you wanna reach out and grab a hold of him and take his hand and belong to him today, if your choice is, Jesus, I choose to belong to you today, this is your moment to do so. And all you have to do is transfer all your trust and hope on to him. If you're here today and your your, your prayer is, Jesus, be my God, be my savior, be my forgiver, be my shepherd. If that's your prayer, if that's what's in your heart, just slip your hand up just right now, just lift it up. So that's my prayer. Go ahead and lift your hand, raise it up, don't hesitate. Both of you down here on the main floor, God is with you. God bless you. Others of you today, your prayer is Jesus. Up there in the balcony in the front, God is with you, man. If your prayer is Christ, come into my life. Christ, be my shepherd. I'm reaching up to you. I'm reaching up to you. If that's your prayer, just slip your hand up. Just lift your hand and say, that's me today. Don't hesitate. Don't leave with a regret today. You get this moment. Time is short. Life is going away. Down here, God is with you. God bless you. Others of you, your prayer today, Christ, come into my life. Don't don't hesitate. Don't leave here today with a regret. This is your opportunity to receive Christ. Slip your hand all the way up. Those of you in the balcony, this is your prayer. Christ, come into my life. Go ahead and raise your hand. Say, that's me. That's me down here on the main floor. Last call. Last call, Colonial. If your prayer is Christ, come into my life, just slip your hand up. Slip it up. All right. We're going to pray together, guys, but we're not praying alone. We're going to pray as a family like we always do. Let's pray. Say, dear God, I need you. I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You died for my sins and you rose from the grave. Forgive all my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your Spirit and make me new. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for new life. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's celebrate together, Colonial. Amen. That's awesome.